outstanding scholars who are also committed to increasing the success of Black engineers. Those selected as BDE fellows are, uh, are all actually currently attending, and they're attending a virtual four-day workshop that will provide opportunities for scientific interactions, career-oriented discussions, and networking. Uh, my name is Arvind Raman. I'm the Executive Associate Dean of the College of Engineering here at Purdue, a professor of mechanical engineering and by courtesy of materials engineering. And it is my honor to introduce the moderators for today's keynote talk. <clears throat> Dr. Tahira Reed Smith is an associate professor in the School of Mechanical Engineering at Purdue and is a NASA visiting scholar. <clears throat> Her research involves the quantification and integration of human-centered considerations in engineering systems and or the design process. Her research program has received funding from the National Science Foundation, Procter & Gamble, the Air Force Office of Scientific Research, and many others. Her projects that involve the intersection of diversity in mechanical engineering have been featured in media sources, including National Geographic, NBC's Today Show, Essence Magazine, Reuters, NPR, and many others. A highly sought after role, role model for the younger generation, Dr. Reed Smith's story about her double Dutch jump rope invention is featured in two children's books and was on the 2017 New York State English and Language Arts Common Core exam administered to over 100,000 fourth graders in the state of New York. Dr. Reed obtained BS and MS degrees in mechanical engineering from the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute and a PhD in design science from the University of Michigan, Ann Arbor. Thank you. The second moderator is Dr. Michael Mike Harris, who is the Robert B. and Virginia B. Professor of Chemical Engineering and Professor courtesy by courtesy of Environmental and Ecological Engineering in the College of Engineering at Purdue University. He served uh, as my colleague, Associate Dean of Engineering for Undergraduate Education from 2006 to 2017. He was inducted into the University of Tennessee's Department of Chemical and Biomolecular Engineering's Hall of Fame in 2017. He received the National Science Foundation Career Award. He was a Purdue University faculty scholar from 2002 to 2007 and was named Fellow of ASEE and Fellow of AICHE in 2009. He won the AICHE Grimes Award for Excellence in Chemical Engineering in 2005 and the AICHE Minority Affairs Distinguished Service Award in 2009. He's the author of approximately 100 peer-reviewed publications and 11 patents. He received his BS in Chemical Engineering from Mississippi State University and his MS and PhD degrees in Chemical Engineering from the University of Tennessee while working full-time at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. Mike's research is in the area of nanomaterials, collides, and interfacial phenomena, transport, transport phenomena, particle science and technology, microwave sensing of pharmaceutical powders, solidification of drug and excipient matrices, environmental control technology, and electrodispersion precipitation processes. Uh, please join me in welcoming our moderators to introduce our speaker for today. Good evening, Tahira and Mike. Good evening. As Arvind said, I'm Mike Harris, and I'm honored to introduce our keynote speaker for this evening, Dr. Wes Harris, the C.S. Draper Professor of Aeronautic and, and Astronautics at the in Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He received his PhD in 1968 from Princeton University. His first faculty positions were in the Department of Aerospace Engineering at the University of Virginia. And he also served as a faculty member uh, of physics at Southern University. Professor Harris joined MIT as an associate professor of aeronautics and astronautics. And he served as the director of the Office of Minority Education for several years. Uh, all of these, uh, at least these two were at uh, MIT. He held a position as manager of computational methods at NASA headquarters. And as you can see, he's been a pretty busy person. He was promoted to professor of aeronautics and astronautics at MIT in 1981. And he was the uh, president and owner of Harris Analytical and Planning 
from 1980 to 1985. I mean, these are all just tremendous accomplishments. He returned to MIT as the ML King Jr. visiting professor and became the C.S. Draper Professor of Aeronautics and Astronautics in 2001. His administrative roles include serving as the School of Engineering, uh, School of Engineering Dean at the University of Connecticut, Vice President and Chief Administrative Officer of the University of Tennessee Space Institute, and an Associate Administrator for Astronautics at NASA Headquarters. He was also head of the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics and Associate Provost for Faculty Equity at MIT. Most recently, he is the founding director of the MIT Hypersonics Research Team, which has been in, exist been in existence since 2015. He has won numerous awards and I will only highlight a few of them. The Sigma Psi Distinguished Lecturer. He was an outstanding, uh, he won the Outstanding Advocacy Award from MIT's Council for the Advancement of Black Students. He won the Presidential Award from the National Organization for the Professional Advancement of Black Chemists and Chemical Engineers. He is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He is also an African Scientific Institute Fellow, American Helicopter Society Fellow, American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronaut, uh, Astronautics Fellow, and he's a member of the National Academy of Engineering. And as I said, these are only some of his awards. His research specializations and interests include areas such as unsteady aerodynamics, aeroacoustics, rotorcraft technology, defense systems acquisition, lean financial management methods, sustainment of capital assets, and sickle cell pathology. Thus you see the breadth of his research interests. Please join me in welcoming Professor Whitley, Wesley, or Wes Harris. And by the way, you have a, a wonderful last name. Um, Professor Harris, Professor Smith, Professor Rahman, I uh, thank you very kindly for allowing me to have a conversation with you and our friends uh, throughout the country on this occasion. Having been around when NSBE was founded, our organization, the tip of the spear for us in engineering, my heart is warmed by this opportunity share this evening with you. Um, <clears throat> when first asked, I, I was overjoyed and certainly said yes. Then I asked myself, well, what should I attempt to communicate? What should the message be? I discarded for this presentation any presentation on statistics how many African-American women are engineers? How many African-American men are engineers? How many Latex, Latino men and women are engineers? That data is interesting. I think it's somewhat static. So I decided not to go there. What occurred to me to share with you are successes. Uh, outstanding successes. And the next chart, um, please, please advance the next chart. Yes, doing that. Uh, the next, no. Sorry. 
There we go. Okay. I want to talk about success. And I want to talk about excellence in that success. Somehow I was able to cross path with three outstanding African Americans in engineering. They're listed there with Joe Whitlow, James Hubbard, Patrick Handler. I've been blessed to have the opportunity to work with these young men um, in producing high quality scholarship. There's obviously a void, a hole that I'm still trying to fill. Namely, Wes, when will you direct a PhD thesis of an Af African-American woman? woman. So I'm still trying to make that happen. But this evening, this, this evening, I want to talk about Whitlow, who has matured to be, as far as I'm concerned, a leading aerospace researcher and manager. I want to talk about Jim Hubbard, who is an academic and inventor. If you just count the letters in Jim Hubbard's name, multiply by five, you still won't have as many, um, enough numbers to cover the number of patents he has produced. And then I have among the top three, Patrick Hanley, who is, I describe as a entrepreneur, second to none. You take a look at the dates on this chart, they cover a decade. Whitlow finishing in 1979, Hubbard in 81, and Patrick Henley in 89. So there's a lot of seasoning for me, a lot of learning for me that occurred in that decade. As reflected in the dates in which these young men receive their PhDs, they are now seasoned individuals. Their world line, their success is well documented. And I like to go back to the source of that success in terms of what actually occurred at MIT. What, how were we able to work together to bring out their greatness, their gifts? And I hope to summarize that in the final chart, bring home the essence, the high quality. What are the points that these three young men have in common that led to such great success. Now, before I get jump into Whitlow, Hubbard, and Hanley, uh, I would like to just share with you how, what was the pivotal thing in my life? What happened to Wes that led him to the point where he crossed paths with Whitlow, Hubbard, and Hanley? What's the source? So in the next chart, I'd like to do that. Start, start with that on the next chart. Okay, so the source. Okay, um, I'm as old as dirt, so I was born in Richmond in 1941. Uh, Richmond was, and, and maybe even still is, a southern segregated city from top to bottom, from north to south, from east to west. On the chart on the far, <clears throat> the far left, you have uh, an entertainer and his wife buying a home in the 40s in Richmond. All right, and that's what a home looked like in the 40s that black folks bought. Okay, look at the gentleman. He has a jacket on. He has a tie on, his wife is neatly dressed, and they're happy to walk into that configuration. But that's what's the best we could do. The middle chart confirms the racist school system that we had. Um, when I started to school, it was in a wooden building, George Mason Elementary School. The second year, the J. Andrew Bowler School opened. It had previously been white, a white-only school. 
That school, J. Andrew Boulder, uh, was made of quarry stone 22 inches thick. And in the center chart here, you see youngsters for the very first time, black ones, going into J. Andrew Bola Elementary School. That was my second school. By the way, to get to that school, as well as to get to George Mason Elementary School, we walked from our black communities through a hostile white community. And that was an experience in itself. But that's how we got started. From education to healthcare, the chart on the far right was taken <clears throat> at Central State Medical Facility. That's a black brother at Central State that supposedly is being treated for a mental illness. Take a look at his surroundings. Grab a hold of what it is that he had to, to do, put up with just to breathe, much less medication and care. But that's good old Virginia, good old Richmond. That's where I grew up. The next chart continues with this source conversation. Uh, so in the upper right, I'm sorry, the upper left, you see uh, black young, uh, young black girls reading books. You see a black woman uh, preparing to wash some dishes and a white woman sort of directing. Getting an education, getting a book was a real challenge for us growing up in Richmond. It was rare for a black person to act alone when it came to basic understanding, basic grabbing hold of knowledge. On the lower left, um, we have a Congress of brothers, all black, celebrating the last person in Richmond to be inducted into the military for the beginning of the Second World War. Um, it, was a, it was an achievement, colleagues. It was an achievement to be so selected at all. So the last person selected was, uh, was a crowd pleaser. The chart on the right, um, Sam Gladden and his brother. Sam Gladden, my age, we played football together at Armstrong High School. Sam is the brother on the left side of that chart. Did those of you who have been through the South recognize what they are doing? Uh, they are in the center of Richmond, up on Lee Street. Summertime, trying to keep cool. That's not a swimming pool, colleagues. That's where horses go to drink. That's where horses go to drink. It was not a public pool. So that's, that's what our recreation, guys. Next chart. Okay. On the far left, you see black young women are getting serious <clears throat> about some academics and some activity that will draw out their artistic uh, interest. Um, there's probably an age distribution with those young women. I won't go uh, into that, but they appear to be of a different age, maybe between the three of them, a difference of four to five years, but they are together working. The middle chart, that is a brother delivering textbooks to the black community we were not allowed to enter the Richmond Public Library. So we had to travel around and push carts with books uh, in order to better serve the black community. And my mother and father paid taxes. They worked and taxes supported the public library, but we were not allowed into the public library. Uh, the chart on the far right is uh, a, a band director at a public school. And you can see our youngsters playing various instruments, um, music, understanding, practice, writing music, living music, 
has always been a part of us. And we've found a way to make that happen, even under the darkest, most dire situations. Okay, next chart, please. Okay, so in all of that chaos, in all of that racism, in all of that segregation, there was a flowering of strength and excellence. Okay, Armstrong High School is where I, I went to get my um, final pub, public school training before college. What a wonderful experience. What a foundational experience. What an electric experience. Profound, absolutely profound. Mrs. Brown, Dr. Brown, received a PhD in biology. And she taught biology at Armstrong High School when I was there. Rosier Diamond obtained her master's degree in mathematics from Columbia University. She taught me <clears throat> solid geometry, plane geometry, Boolean algebra, and calculus in high school. Eloise Bowles Washington, I listed her as in bold and underscored in physics. Eloise Bowles Washington went north to the University of Pennsylvania in the late 40s to earn a master's degree in physics. Came back to Richmond, teach in the public schools. And Y.B. Williams uh, obtained his PhD in history and taught history at our high school in Richmond. So the mathematics, the social concerns, the biology, the physics, all were a part of the excellent, the foundational, the motivational um, elements that propelled me uh, to better understand the world and the opportunities that were presented. Lucille Brown, Rosie Diamond, Eloise Bowles Washington, and Y.B. Williams. Just a snipping of the high quality teaching, mentoring, directing, guidance, love and care that was provided at Armstrong High School, totally segregated, Every single textbook we had in that school was a hand-me-down from the white schools. Sometimes the pages would be torn out. Sometimes the end work would be written all over the, the pages. But we made it work. We made it work. Next chart, please. Okay, and this, this for me is one of the pivotal events of my life. In the spring of my junior year, I built a cloud chamber. And my mentor, my director uh, was Eloise Bowes Washington, my physics teacher. We wanted to actually observe the collision of alpha particles with water droplets. Hence the cloud chamber, the black cloth on the bottom, uh, the top was visible. You could use a camera and actually collect, actually take photographs of the collision dynamics of alpha particles with water droplets. We built the chamber within Armstrong High School. Okay. We collected the dry ice we needed to generate the clouds, all of which we did within Armstrong High School. Now, this was before internet. You know, you couldn't look up. Uh, how to do this. Uh, we knew what we needed to do and we built this cloud chamber. All right, so we built a cloud chamber. Then we go prancing right down to the Black High School Science Fair. It wins first place. It wins first place at Virginia State College. Of all the high schools in the state of Virginia, black ones that, that participated, that project was first place in, in physics. Okay, so <clears throat> I thought we were done. 
Ms. Washington said, Wesley, you're not done. We go to the White High School Science Fair at the University of Virginia. Okay, so Ms. Washington, Eloise Bowles Washington, I salute, I say, yes, ma'am, let's go. We came in third. We came in third in physics with our cloud chamber at the White High School Science Fair on ground, the University of Virginia. That disturbed Mrs. Washington greatly. Um, she tried her best to defend me and said it wasn't my fault, said it was her fault, that we came in third, not first. But she said, Wesley, sit down. I want to talk to you. Number one, you will go to University of Virginia. And you will go for three reasons. One, your blackness. Everyone on that, uh, at that university will look at you and will not be confused about the fact that you are an African-American. Number two, second reason for going, you will achieve, you will do well. And the third reason, and this is the piece was so important to Mrs. Washington and she made it, uh, presented to me in such a way that it became important to me, that you will demonstrate to white people excellence and scholarship. This was the pivotal moment in my career. That meeting, that set down, Wesley, we will now go forward and this is how and why. The whole idea of excellence and scholarship for, by, and about black folks, as far as I'm concerned, came to me through Eloise Bowles Washington. And I had no fear. Once Ms. Washington said do it, I did complete confidence that I would be, I am prepared to do so. But this for me was critically important. Okay, so that's the background folks. The rest of how I got to MIT is in material, but this, this is foundational. Eloise Bowles Washington, a cloud chamber, excellence rewarded, within the black community, but not recognized in the white community. Eloise Bowles Washington says, Wesley, we take this as an opportunity. You will demonstrate to them, white folks, excellence and scholarship. Next chart, please. Okay, so now I wanna talk about these guys who I uh, showed me what scholarship really was about. Didn't, had no idea it was this high level when I was at UVA. Whitlow. Um, Whitlow finished his PhD at MIT in 79. The title of his PhD thesis is Application of the Method of Parametric Differentiation to Two-Dimensional Transonic Flows. And I, uh, we'll talk a lot about that in the next several charts. James Hubbard. The academic, the innovator, the gentleman with, with a, an arm length of, uh, of, of patents. Okay, a long thesis, but let me make sure I read every word of it. Dynamic pressure and velocity trends of a model helicopter rotor enhancing blade slap, a high angle of attack, and two tip speeds, 1981. Excuse the language, but that, it, that turned out to be a hell of a thesis. And if you just slowly go through the title of that thesis and ask, what are these words? What do they mean? How are they related? What was this gentleman really about? What was the state of technology? when he was doing this. How many breakthroughs are involved? And then Mr. Hanley, Mr. Patrick Hanley, the entrepreneur of the three. And you read his thesis slowly as well. 
a multi-domain pseudo-spectral solution for general frequency unsteady transonic small disturbance equation. Hey, underscore general frequency, not just low frequency, okay, arbitrary, general. 1989. So let me try to unpack these three achievements and then come back and summarize the character of these three gentlemen. Next chart, please. Okay, so this is a photograph on the upper right of Woodrow Whitlow, uh, probably when he was still in grade school. He doesn't look that way now, uh, but that's, that's Whitlow. <laughs> okay, so Woodrow Whitlow, uh, he, he's born and reared in a place called Inkster, Michigan. Okay, that's a city built by Ford Motor Company, primarily for blacks who worked at Ford. Um, came to MIT as an undergraduate, stayed through his master's and PhD. Very fine gentleman in every sense of the word. We worked together on his PhD thesis at a time when computational fluid dynamics was just emerging. There were some schemes that were very slow, did not capture the shock correctly, et cetera. So Wertlow decided that if we really want a design algorithm, where we want to be able to better understand the impact of angle of attack, for example, the thickness ratio, that is the thickness to length of the airfoil, the reduced frequency, how rapidly are the shocks moving on the upper surface of the airfoil, for example, or the pitch and heat frequency, and of course, buffering. So what Whitlow did was use this method of parametric differentiation, embedded into his developed CFD code that proved to be faster, more accurate, more, robu more robust than then existing at that time CFD codes. Now, Woodrow Whitlow left us at MIT. He, his first location was Nassau Langley. And from Nassau Langley, he moved to other locations within NASA. He was the, the director of the NASA Glenn Center in Cleveland. He was the essential NASA employee that led NASA to recover from the Columbia accident. He was at uh, Cape Canaveral um, at that particular time. Following that, he ended up in his last job at NASA was uh, working in the administrator's headquarters. And if you Google uh, Whitlow, you'll see all sorts of activities involving him and NASA. Okay. To his <clears throat> left is uh, a photograph of uh, transonic flow, a schematic of transonic flow over an airfoil. And uh, it's probably not legible, not big enough for you to see, but that's the kind of problems he was working on. What is the location of that shock wave? How rapidly is it oscillating? What is the buffet effect? And how do I put another, how do I examine another shock wave of a different ratio, of a different angle of attack? He integrated all of that into his code. Uh, and what you see on the lower side of the right chart is I think that's uh, 737 max, uh, but that's, those planes don't have buffet anymore. Um, certainly, not. Bowen has his own codes, but Whitlow made his contributions as well. Next chart, please. Okay, on the upper right is Professor James Herbert. He is our academic and our innovator. During the Korean War, the U.S. forces were losing helicopters. Um, quite frequently and by 
the opposition simply uh, observing and with a hand pistol being able to shoot the tail rudder, the helicopter becomes unstable and, and crashes. And he could do this without any instrumentation, right? Just the human ear. The human ear is all they needed to distinguish which, heli which type of helicopter was in approaching and from which direction it was approaching. So no complications, just the human ear and a four to five caliber pistol or maybe even less. So how do you handle it? What is the problem? What were they doing? What were these, what were the opposition doing? They were listening to the acoustic signature of the helicopter. Hueys, um, Chinooks, they all may have a different acoustic signature. So if you want to manage the problem of losing these helicopters, you've got to adjust the acoustic signature. And there are many types. There's broadband noise, um, uh, rotational noise, and there's blade slap. Blade slap. What is that? Now, I would imagine Jim Hubbard asked himself, what is the source of the noise? And how do I measure the source of the noise? He probably asked himself, what is the noise propagation pattern? What's the envelope of the noise? And third, what does it look like? Physically, what is the rotor blade actually doing? Where is the wake shedded by that rotor? And what happens when the rotor blade passes through that? A very, very difficult problem. You're in a laboratory, an aerocoric chamber. You have rotating blades. You ask the question, what is the loading on those blades? Okay. First part of the question, we'll just instrument the blade. Uh-oh. What do you mean instrument the blades? It's rotating. How do I get those measurements into the laboratory frame? I remember now, this is still, the, uh, we're approaching 1981. How do you do this? Slip rings. What? No, gold slip rings. Right? So he's got to build a blade. He's got to measure the loads on that blade. And he's got to transmit that load through slip rings to the laboratory system, the laboratory frame. He also wants to see, actually observe that blade slashing through a vortex. How do you set that up? How do you use strobes to do this? So for the first time in aerodynamics, we're able to understand, to measure the source, simultaneously me measure the acoustic propagation, the fog field noise, and visualize the intersection of the tip of the roller blade with the trailing vortex. So this was an achievement, colleagues, that, um, that still stands as a reference. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, we define, Hubbard defined, the limits of blade slap onset. Uh, he's gone on to be quite successful. Uh, he is a Hagler Fellow at Texas A&M University. He is a member of the National Academy of Engineering. He is the father of um, smart structures. Um, he made similar contribu seminal contributions in industry as well as at the University of Maryland and College Park and at Langley. Um, a, a true superstar. I'm, I'm so proud to, to have met him and work with him and could call him not only a colleague, but a friend. Nick Sharp. Okay, so this is my entrepreneur. This is Patrick Handley. Uh, St. Kitts and Nevis, out in the Atlantic. Oh, by the way, I forgot to tell you, you probably saw it on the chart. 
James Herbert, Danville. Okay, so I'm from Richmond, he's from Danville. I'm a generation, two, three generations older. But you can imagine what it was like in Danville as well. So Herbert has seen some, uh, the better, the worst side of, of, of human interaction as well. Okay, so uh, St. Kitts, Nevis for Patrick. Um, Patrick is a little bit different from Whitlow and from uh, Hubbard. Whitlow and Hubbard earned all of their degrees at MIT, baccalaureate, masters, and PhDs. Um, Patrick Hanley came to us from uh, NYU, I believe, with, uh, to join us. So he earned his baccalaureate degree in New York. Came to us with, with a background already in acoustics, um, but a very good, excellent applied mathematician, understood transonics, jumped deeply into nonlinear unsteady transonics, where the problem is inherently nonlinear. There is no linear problem of any value at all in the unsteady nonlinear transonics problem. Unsteadiness, what on earth are you talking about? What, what are you modeling? The frequency of these changes. The frequency of these changes. And notice what he's doing in a multi-domain pseudo-spectral solution, not CFD, but a pseudo-spectral solution. Wonderful job. As far as I'm concerned, the most, most efficient solver, a high frequency nonlinear transonic flow over Air Force sections, certainly for his time. Patrick has gone on to build companies. Uh, he's also uh, had the great fortune of working in uh, companies owned by other, or founded and owned by other MIT graduates. And I think if I'm not mistaken, uh, that company's been bought and sold for a uh, considerable amount of money. Okay, next chart. This is my last one. Whitlow, Hubbard, Hanley. What are their gifts? What made the difference? In my, my old age, I've identified six qualities, assets, gifts that these three young men share. Extremely high intelligence. All of them went, went right through the MIT PhD requirements, hitting home runs at every step of the way. They understood their research, their PhD research. Well posed problems, each of them, knowing when they have solved the well posed problem. High intelligence. Fearless. I mean, these guys would run through brick walls. Nothing would intimidate them, nothing would make them afraid. I really mean that. In the MIT environment, and, and these gentlemen will tell you, we had our black group of researchers, okay? Martin Landau came from Sweden. He had a Swedish mafia of graduate students. Trillin and Walkman had their Israeli mafia of graduate students. So we worked together as African-Americans. We had a couple of white students in there and certainly uh, East Asian students. We were fearless, we were fearless back down from no challenge. These gentlemen were resourceful. Pick on either one of them and ask, how did you get this done? Uh, it, it was lying around for you to just pick it up and do it. What resources did you actually use to do this? How did you figure out you needed go lay the slip rings, for example, in Hubbard's case? How do you do this? How do you be successful? Okay. Self-confident, and I don't mean cockiness, 
I mean, these young men were prepared to do the hard work and they showed their self-confidence. They stood with their heads up, their shoulders back, their chest out and stomach in. They were self-confident and were never afraid of any intellectual challenge that, all, that came their way. Resilient, absolutely. Knocked down, uh-uh, I'm getting up. And last but not least, intentional. Intentional about excellence and scholarship. Mrs. Eloise Bowles Washington would marvel at these young men's achievements. So for NSPE, my objective tonight, this evening, is to share with you some of the strength that I've observed in our black young scholars. It's been an enormously rewarding journey for me. These young men are still contributing to the advancement of scholarship. They're some of the strongest I've ever met. And it's been my blessing to have met them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Harris, for that inspirational and just very awesome presentation. Um, we have a few minutes left and we have about eight minutes left. And so I'd like to open up the floor for any questions. If you have a question, please uh, raise your hand. Um, also, let's give him a virtual applause. You should have a reaction button, I think, and you can, there you go, thumbs up, hearts. Let's give him a, an applause. Thank you. Okay, so I see Leo Green has his hand up for a question. Please go ahead, Leo. Yes, um, excellent, excellent talk. Very motivational. Um, I have a question regarding one of your statements that you mentioned uh, in your storyline uh, at the beginning, and it had to do with um, demonstrating excellence and scholarship to white folks. And I wonder if that latter part has changed over years, over, over your years, yes, demonstrating Leo. excellence to a specific group. Yes, Leo, it has changed. There's no question about that. Um, <clears throat> So you remember that story, right? Uh, I was under the under the, the spell, let's say, of Eloise Bowes Washington. This was an African American woman that went north in the forties, for some strange reason, to earn a master's degree in physics at the University of Pennsylvania. Imagine what she had to go through in that experience, Leo. You know, out of the south, going north to Philadelphia. What would she do when she wanted to get her hair fixed? Was she asked to sit in the back of the classroom, earning her piece, earning her master's in physics? Was she she do all of that and came back to Richmond? And for that generation, as well as mine, the idea was, how do you produce scholarship that was absolute, that white folks would accept? Would accept? I mean, that's that's what motivated the scientists of that era. And it has changed since then. But remember now, this was in my junior year in high school when uh, Ms. Washington, Eloise Bowles Washington said, sit down, you got to talk. Thank you, I love it. All right, I see, I didn't see who was first, but I'll just go in the order. Um, Kajumba, then John Junkins. Oh, thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. Uh, my question is about the last, like the lung. Here you have told us about intelligence theories. Mine goes on the theories. When you look at the current trend, if you are kind of theorist, they take you to be someone who is not respectful. So how do you find a balance between being theorist and respectful at the same time? Okay. Um, so how do I balance being fearless with the other part of your question? 
Uh, the other point is being respectful, like respecting oh, because. Okay. Yes. Yeah. All right. So, yes. Okay. So let me put fearless in context. Um, I, I don't mean being boisterous or having guns or knives or sticks or anything of that sort. I mean having an inter, inter strength <clears throat> that you are prepared to face adversity. And it can come from a relationship with your advisor. It can come from um, going down a dark alley in terms of your research and you hit a, hit a, hit a stone wall. You got to find a way around that. Just not being afraid, having confidence in yourself based on preparation that you are, that you will in fact not cop out and be a chump, but you're gonna stay there and get the job done. I think that is being respectful. I think that's saying to the world and to oneself um, that I believe that I really do have faith that we'll get this done. So, so, and that's how I'm using the word fearless, okay? And it, it, it's not, it's not a rebel rouser. No, it's the inner strength to face challenges. Okay, uh, I would like to say this. Um, uh, I think one of the most important things about a PhD were three things. One, money. You gotta support students. Two, the research topic. And three, the quality of the relationship between the student and the advisor. Okay, paramount. If any of those three are out of order, you can have a very, very difficult time, if not impossible. Two people, a group of folk getting together, trying to do research, you gotta be fearless to make that happen. John? Hey, how you doing, Wes? Good to see hey, you. Good to see you as well. I missed the early part of your talk, but I got, got in the middle of the of the Hubbard show there. And it, um, I want to comment uh, on uh, your fearless uh, description. I, I think, um, you know, uh, mentors and mentees, uh, as you were describing, uh, the relationship is just so very important. Uh, and uh, I think you were a pioneer uh Wes, and uh, I would um, I'd maybe describe things, uh, uh, maybe using other adjectives, uh, uh, ten tenacious, uh, relentless, uh, uh, just when you, uh, when, as you say, when you run into a, uh, uh, an obstacle, you, you consider it a temporary setback. You say, okay, well, what's the way around this? And uh, just uh, the tenacity that I observed in uh, Wes Harris as a, uh, as a young man uh, has stuck with you through your career. And I think it was a contagious disease apparently because uh, your mentees uh, likewise, I see as being very tenacious and, uh, and willing to uh, take um, a long view and work hard to, uh, to get the job done, even if there are obstacles. So I think this tenacity is uh, perhaps I would describe it, uh, your, your, your fearlessness has a ha, implies uh, tenacity, in my opinion. Thank you, John. For, for those of you so assembled, uh, Professor John Junkins uh, is the president of Texas A&M University. Uh, we go back more than 50 years when we shared a small office together um, <clears throat> at the University of Virginia in the Department of Aerospace Engineering. So we've been bumping around into each other um, for, for, for 50 years. Um, he's a very modest gentleman, so he would not tell you that he's president of A&M, but he is. Uh, and he's also an outstanding researcher and achiever of the first magnitude. Um, puts me to shame when we compare his, his production, his productivity to mine. Okay, well, I don't see... We haven't bumped into each other on the basketball court in about 40-something years, so Wes, that was... <laughs> the beginning of our bonding, I think, even though we shared an office, that, that helped us out a little bit. Yeah, it did, it did. I just have to say, I know we're just about at, out of time, but um, thank you, um, Dr. Junkins, for your time with us. And I also wanna acknowledge uh, two of 
Dr. Harris's former students that are here quietly in the background. I see Patrick Hanley here and James Hubbard. If you want to unmute and just say a few words, um, we welcome that. Um, otherwise, um, yeah, you should say some words. Do, um, you guys are amazing. Um, so please, uh, Dr. Hanley and Dr. This is, this is Jim Hubbard. Okay. I'll say a few short words. I've been under the spell of Wes Harris for 40 years. <laughs> I would like for everyone here to know that uh, Wes talked about uh, aerodynamics, but what I love about Wes is he's not like most engineers. Most engineers uh, engineer some specific system or technology. I want you to know that Wes Harris engineers engineers, okay? He built me from the ground up. I was a violent kid living in Baltimore, Maryland, never heard of MIT, and Wes Harris flew to my house mm. in a bad neighborhood and talked to my mama and got permission to spank me if I misbehaved. <laughs> wow. My final statement about Wes is, you know, there's a great Chinese saying, a superior man. It's long, but one of the statements in there says, and seeking no recognition, recognition never leaves him. And that's my advisor and mentor, Wes Harris. And I'm done. I'm out. Hey, Jim. Thank you. Dr. Hanley, putting you on the spot. Would you like to say a few words? Um, if you're talking, you probably are still muted. I don't know if he's trying to talk. Is he still here? Oh, there he is. Okay, are you muted? Oh, oh your, your volume is a little low. Can you get closer to your mic? Um, I would like to thank Professor Harris for his mentorship. And um, speaking of um, fairness, um, I remember when I would go to Professor Harris's office with a problem, what he would say is, you can do that, can't you? And um, I, whether I can do it or not, I had to always say, yes, I can do it. And just go back and actually do it. So it's, I don't know where the fearlessness came from, but um, just his confidence in how we can solve problems and how we can approach not only the technical um, aspect of the problem, but other people and how to take, take advantages of all the resources at MIT. In the end, I had ordered, uh, a lot of people in mathematics and aeronautics and just to get the problem done. And, just on um, Professor Harris's advice and wisdom and personal help um, led to all of that. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. So, hey, Tarira, um, may I uh, yes. recognize uh, Barrett? Yes. He just left. No, is he? Oh, here, there he is. Uh, uh, Professor Cardwell. Cardwell. Uh, he is an MIT product as well. We bumped in to him or to each other uh, when he was obtaining his baccalaureate degree at MIT. Thank you. Um, I, I have to say that um, Professor Harris uh, was extremely influential to me, partially because he was scary. He was not just fearless, he was fear inducing. Um, but, <clears throat> One of the things that became the most important to me, remember that for me as a black undergraduate at MIT, which with all due respect to my Aero Astro colleagues at Purdue is still perhaps the greatest Aero Astro program ever created. And I actually got to see a faculty member who looked like me as an undergraduate. And he told me not to work with him just because he looked like me. 
if I worked with him because I was interested in unsteady flow, in transonics, in rotorcraft uh, unstable dynamics, those were great things. I, I, I was in space systems, so, so no. But that lesson of being excellent was something that made it possible for me to be a faculty member and to be an, a mentor and a representative to other people because I had Professor Harris to watch. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. Harris, thank you so much again. We have a session, a closed session right after this. Um, I do invite um, all the BTE fellows, Dr. Wesley Harris, Dr. James Hubbard, Dr. Patrick Hanley, and you as well, Dr. Barrett Caldwell, to stay on and other faculty that will, um, I see uh, Lucy, uh, Dr. Castillo, stay on for the, the Q&A. But everyone else, we thank you for your time. The recording will be available um, um, soon and you can watch the replay, but we have a closed session after this. Thank you for your time.